I think that Sankofa, Emotep, Constitution, I think you guys are the source of a lot of consternation that the people in the western part of the state are feeling. And if you pay attention, I forget, I think it's a Pittsburgh area newspaper, but it's a couple of writers mm -hmm. that just beat this mm -hmm. to death. Mm -hmm. You know, that somehow you guys have some unfair mm -hmm. and distinct advantage and we just need to pull mm -hmm. charters and Catholics out of the regular competition with the traditional high schools. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that was also the source of the impetus to go to six divisions, which I think is too much. I mean, you know why they went to six. They just want a chance to play. Yeah, District 12 was winning everything. Everything. So they figured if they... So what do you feel about this, let's let's call it hostility, mm -hmm. towards Catholic schools and charter schools in the Philadelphia area? Mm -hmm. I mean, first and foremost, you know, it's, it's, that's a political problem, right? Irresponsible expansion of charter schools is what created a lot of these issues and a lack of charter oversight. Charter schools could do what they want. That's the problem that you need to talk to your state reps about. When they are in their counties and they're mad about this, they don't call their state senators and their state reps that vote against our schools, against our funding, and against our children year in and year out. They think of ways that they can cripple black kids. And this is 100% an issue about race. That's what this is. It's an issue of race and it's ways that people who don't see our kids on a consistent basis brainstorm different ways that they can create negative narratives about them and how they can cripple them. Instead of creating laws and rules, right, what they do is attack individual institutions and they look to try to close those individual institutions. So if I'm following the argument, the, the, the initial thrust was to try to, and I agree wholeheartedly, to break the backs of the unions of the principals and the teachers and just the, the funding sources of, of the regular public schools. Especially and when in they the decided. process, you created these autonomous entities that are kicking your ass in sports. Right. And now, so they didn't think about you didn't that. Think that's about the, that's that. the residue. So this is a back end problem right. you're having. Right. Because you're only giving these, what you charters get, what, eight, nine thousand a kid? Not as much per pupil as public schools, but the key is this is what they did too, right? Mm -hmm. So then what they did was they said, that the charter schools in Philadelphia, right? Before, if you were a charter school, the school district would get their money, the charter schools would get their money. Then they changed the rules and said that charter schools money come out of the school district's budget. So once you did that, you automatically pin neighborhood traditional so public schools against, against charter, charter schools. schools. So when everybody say, are you for charter or against charter? What type of stupid question is that? I'm for public. kids. Yeah, we're all public and yes. it's all my money because I pay taxes. Yes. So. They have created a bunch of narratives to try to create the perception that charters are bad or this is this is against that. But and I ain't saying charters are perfect. Charters definitely have issues. Mm -hmm. But instead of trying to address the issues, they're trying to create rules to hurt the kids. Yes. That's the that's that's stupid. There's a little girl somewhere in central Pennsylvania, I forget the name of the school. She's an eleventh grader, good player. She transferred in. They've already ruled her ineligible. Crazy. An 11th grade girl in central, and, and she's an unintended. I know this wasn't aimed at whoever she is in some county in central PA, but they said she can't play her whole junior. I'm like, why not give her five games or something? What? Took the whole season away. So these draconian policies and reform measures that they're implementing are designed to hurt you guys. Absolutely. To hurt us and our kids. And mm -hmm. so, like, you know, I, I, I've. And no one's going to tell me that my opinion or perception isn't based on facts and experience. Look, I've, I'm one of the few people, 34 years old, I'm mm -hmm. the head coach here. Mm -hmm. I was the athletic director. I sat on the board for PIAA District 12. I'm president of the Coaches Association. I get the politics and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I'm talking to the politicians. I know the state reps. I know the state senators. I know folks that work for the governor. So you're not going to tell me that this stuff isn't politics. It don't have nothing to do with basketball. These are political decisions that people are making because they understand they hurt poor children and children of color. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we sometimes get blinded by the bigger issue and catch ourselves kind of going after each other like it's our fault. 
all the time. It, it's not our fault. This is it, we didn't create these conditions that the young people are forced to kind of play under. It's not on us. Mm -hmm. And so when I see some of the stuff that's going on, and whenever I get the opportunity to speak on it, first and foremost, I'm honest. It's an issue of race. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they could do something about it. They don't want to. They don't want to see our kids be successful. Third, I always push and commend the basketball community because we can all look and point to things that people do wrong. But when you look at the big picture of stuff, most of us are doing things right. And most of us got good intentions. Our intentions are pure. And we're looking to do things that's in the best interest of the kids. And we don't even recognize that these all these powers and players to be that's all around us that's trying to make sure that our kids feel. I say, I say that all the time to guys. I think, you know, when they say, you know, I don't really mess with him or I don't, don't, don't say it. I said, you do understand, really, we all on the same team. I said, you know, if you, if you look at the overall success rate, however you want to measure it, you can use graduation rates as the, as the data point. If you look at the overall graduation rate, for black males in Philadelphia in four mm -hmm. years, it's going to be abysmal. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at all the kids that are involved in AAU and high school basketball, it, it, in AAU, it, I, it may I, be 100. I, I mean, I, I really, much higher. it's more than twice as high. Easily. Definitely Easily. way north of 90. I can't remember the last time I had to deal with a kid that did not graduate from high school. I have one I, player in nine years of coaching who did not graduate, any, 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 and it's because he transferred. He left us his junior year and decided that this wasn't the place for him. Now, look, Sam Kofer in our senior year, and up the same way. The senior year is not a cakewalk. You it. have a lot of free time to be able to make your own decisions, kind of like college, mm -hmm. but the academic requirements are rigorous for your mm -hmm. senior year. And you have to do a speech in front of people. Mm -hmm. Our kids fear public speaking more than they fear making two free throws at the end of the game. So... I understand why some kids would want to escape that situation. It's not what I would encourage mine to do. You know, we don't want to take to get used to taking the easy way out academically. But at the same time, when you look at this situation as far as where our kids in, you know, it, it's very rarely do we have kids that leave because by the time you've gotten to this point of being a senior, you understand that this is the situation that God put you in. And we helping you do your college application. Every person that's saying that, college application. All of them going to tell you they want to play college basketball. And so graduating from high school, that's like that's something you, you know, it's a given. Yeah. You know, I have to do yeah. that. Yeah. And you talk to the brothers that, that really aren't engaged and really aren't going through the socialization process of some mm -hmm. of the better programs. Because, you know, I, I can remember when Rob, Rob Moore had Savon Goodman mm -hmm. and Quan Walker in them. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine was coaching um, and he wanted to go see him. He came from out of town and he went to go to the game and... Savon Goodman wasn't playing. Hmm. And it's like, yo, you know, what's going on? And he had missed practice. And I was like, you know, I, I really like that, Rob. Because, you know, Savon was a one problem. of the best players. Yeah. Probably the best player we played against. Yes. Savon, Jabril. But that's a program. Yes. A program has expectations yes. and consequences. Mm -hmm. Andre Noble has them. Mm -hmm. Matt Griffin has them. Mm -hmm. John Mosco has them. Rob Moore has them. Kenan ran over the overbook. Yeah, Kenan, he has them. Yeah. You know, we got a bunch of teams out here. AAU teams. Mm -hmm. We got high school teams. But the programs do an excellent job. How do we, as a community, get these guys, these programs, these high schools, these AAU programs, to see what you and I clearly see, which is that we're all on the same team? I think that the first thing that has to happen is some experience. Right, a lot of times when you're a young guy and you come, and I, you know, I'm young in age, but in the coaching world, I'm not the youngest guy. So when you come in, you know, you're the best coach. Mm -hmm. You want to win a championship. Mm -hmm. You're ready to use this job to launch to get, get another to job to do something else. And I get that because I know what it means to be that young, ambitious guy who can have all these goals. And I think what every, what I would advise every co young coach to have is two mentors, two coaches that serve as mentors because. Anybody who is worth a lick that coaches basketball, what they're going to tell you is most of your work is not going to have to do with X's and O's. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, I might not be a, a person that you could talk to about, you know, what's the best offensive scheme to run or mm -hmm. what's the best inbound plays to run, right? But come talk to me about how to deal with the refs, mm -hmm. how to master that, mm -hmm. right? Come talk to me about how to schedule, how to create your schedule, right? I know exactly, oh, you don't want to play this game in this days or have, so it's other nuances come talk to me about having kids with behavior problems or IEPs or mental disorders right because sometimes when we come into this game we think it's going to be one way and you kind of need an old head to tell you like look 
you know, ABC, X, Y, Z. I'll give you a good example for, you know, being an athletic director. One of the things that you got to do is raise a lot of money for mm -hmm. your different programs. And so when I came in as an athletic director, I was like really, really young and mm -hmm. didn't know how to do it. My CEO introduced me to two people, one person, which was Andre Noble, and then my dad introduced me to Will Cambria, who was at Del, who was at Del Val at the time. So I'm like, I don't need these dudes. I know sports, mm -hmm. right? But then once you start to talk to other athletic directors, you not only realize that there's a lot you don't know, you realize that, yo, you can easily fix this just by calling Dre mm -hmm. or texting Will. Mm -hmm. They can just show you A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And I think sometimes what happens is you a young guy, you coming in, and your pride getting away. You mm -hmm. done played for this coach. You done did this with this person. You you got all the answers. Dude, I'm not trying to talk to you about basketball, right? But you about to spend all this money on such and such. Mm -hmm. They giving that away for free over here. Save that money for uniforms and go get that free for them. We tend to come with built-in factions behind us. You know, your homies. You know, your guys that support you. And they riding with you to the bitter end. And Sometimes they see they yes someone man. else trying to do something like we don't like him right we don't want to work with him we don't want to see him succeed right you know and it, it's painful to watch and my old heads and the way i look at all of this thing god bless him i miss him every day claude groups yeah i used to, play I used claude. to talk to claude every day a couple times a day and he ran the sixes camp up on copman avenue back in the day and you know claude, oh, no, sunny hill camp sixers it came camp. Sunny, from sunny you hill. knew where it was coming from yep. He yeah. gonna give it to you raw. He gonna give it to you as honest as he possibly can, yeah. and he gonna give it to you straight yeah. as he possibly can. And Mo Howard, those guys, you know, they just they just come at it. And so I try to take that in, and I'm trying, but you know, it gets frustrating, you know, because you realize, you know, this guy he just don't want to deal with me or the program or whatever I'm trying to do just because. And the kids ends up suffering. They do. You know, because you, you can't miss hold, out on events. Yeah, you can't hold things. coaches accountable. Look, if you're a young coach and you don't have a mentor, even if you're not a young coach, if you're a coach in this game and you don't have mentors, then you're probably doing something wrong. Heimerdinger is a great example. Heimerdinger is the coach at Fells, mm -hmm. used to coach at Doherty back in the mm -hmm. day. And so Heimerdinger is one of the guys who, you know, I'm the president of the Coaches Association. So I got, like, you know, the old school guys like Heimerdinger who were with me. And then I got the younger guys too. So, but Heimerdinger is more than just a coach to me. That was my middle school gym teacher. Got it. And so, Heimerdinger is the best, I don't care what nobody said, he's the best in the city if you need a scouting report. If you played a team, if he played that team, he's got the notes. Oh, man, to the T. And, and this is the thing, right? I got relationships with all the coaches, so I call everybody for scouting reports. Nobody gives a better scouting report than Heimerdinger. If you don't have mentors in your life, how are you going to know that? All right, one last, one last question. Is there anything that we on the outside the grassroots community can do to increase the attendance, the school spirit, and just make it a better experience for attending public league games. You know, I'll be quite honest, the difference between, say, a game out in Delaware County or in Suburban One or in the Catholic League, you know, just what you get when you walk in the door. You sure. know, the full stands. Sure. The alums. You yeah. know, just you feel safe. You know, That's you got no issues. You got, a, yeah. Versus when you come to some of the public league games and you realize, you know, it's not no women in here. It's not a lot of kids in here. It's a bunch of dudes because, you know, the other people may not feel like, yeah. I don't want to deal with that. And is there anything we could do maybe through social media, through live streaming game, just to build it back. Because when I was a kid, you couldn't go see a West Philly or Oldbrook game. There was, there was no room. Yeah. I mean, I think so. First, first thing is, like, I think when you do go to some of the better games, mm -hmm. when it's two quality teams, you're going to have that level of, of participation. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing. I think social media does impact it, though, because, like, I don't have to go to the game. I could just look on my phone later to kind of find out find what, out what happened. happened. So that kind of impacts it as well. But can you but use can social media do? to increase the buzz. So I, I think that there's a couple of things that folks outside of the community can do in order to kind of increase the buzz and help um, the participation when it comes to games and things of that capacity. One, and you do it a lot and a lot of other folks do it, is just to promote our kids. Mm -hmm. So people know that there are good kids good that are players. playing. You need so to go you see them. You need yeah. to go see them. And I think that is the uh, first and foremost. Um, the next thing, you know, I think that Media is different, right? So if I'm Philly.com or Black Cager Sports, right, mm -hmm. and the incident happens, media has to report it. That's what media does. Media reports information. But if you're not media, there's no reason to share negativity. Mm -hmm. So 
if something were to happen at a game, you know, I, I just feel like when stuff happened at public league games, it's magnified way more than anywhere else. Always, and that goes yeah. back to your point about, you know, the built-in perceptions about sure. black urban kids. Yes, you know? and so, like, to not magnify those things will help. And then, um, you know, I think that's important because, again, when negative things happen, we're quick to, to, to spread the word about that. And um, there was one more thing I was going to say. I forgot. It slipped my mind that fast. But, you know, to go to a um, – Catholic League playoff game, and it's nine thousand people in there. Yeah, and go to a public league game, it's a thousand. Yeah, and like you say, it could be King or you guys or 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 Emotep. I mean, Emotep's got eight, nine Division One players that are going to play. I mean, we, why why we don't embrace this? It's 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 really befuddling to me. I'm really trying to grasp it, and I do think a lot of it just has to do with the perception you know maybe it's not safe because you know just a pure basketball fan so I remember come out so the safety thing right so the safety thing I think is perception more than reality because mm -hmm. um, you know if you go to some other games that mm -hmm. aren't public league you might they'll have full riots at those mm -hmm. games mm -hmm. um, also right we talked about this whole issue about when you asked me about the public league getting back to good 20 teams and I said no primarily because of politics and finances finances is a big issue in a public league right I play my home games at Frankfurt and at Emotep I tried to play my games at Kensington Kappa right down the street do you know how much the school district tried to hit us over the head just to be able to play games Kensington Kappa that is a district right good. down the street how much they want maybe like a hundred and some change an hour ouch and then you got to pay for security too. So now basically the only way I can get that money back is by charging people to come to our games, which means I got to put somebody at the door to collect money. And so the whole process becomes uh, uh, very time consuming and also very costly. So again, I'm in a good situation. I can call Ben Dubin. I graduated from Frankfurt. I got a great relationship with them. We got a cooperative sponsorship with them. I can call Ben Dubin and do home games there. I can call Andre. We got the same CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Sankofa Emotep under the same umbrella as far as administration, right? So I can call Andre, do some home games at Emotep, do some home games at Frankfurt. And that's where we're doing all our home games at. But everybody's not in a good fortune as far as their situation. Yeah, I've, I've been to rec centers. And that's tough, there. right? I don't yeah. want to tell Del Greco to come see me play in the middle of of, 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 of uh, Gambrel projects. When PET was rolling, you know, they played in that little one bench going around. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. MCS was playing up at uh, uh, Berean, Berean Institute yeah. and then uh, on, uh, on Martin tile. the King Rex Center. That's what I'm saying. Floor, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That, y you could look at the institution and say, well, if you can't find a quality court, then you shouldn't have a basketball program. Mm -hmm. And you could say that, but who suffers? Because mm -hmm. that, that adult is going to get the same salary whether yes. they're coaching or not, yes. right? We yes. get $3,000 if we, if we luck. I mean, 7000 if we lucky. 3000 if you got a post. Mm -hmm. And last I checked, that ain't much money. So mm -hmm. we can, we, it's, it's, it's a lot of nuances involved in it. But again, I, when you look at the issue of like why people don't come to our game and why is some of these gyms so dull and dry and where's the security at and where's the alumni and I mean, all this stuff ties into it, right? Do I really want to promote people to come to my game if I know we're playing in a rec center or do I want to just get this game over with with no incidents? Mm -hmm. I had a game with West Philly against Snell and a great game um, a couple years back. And maybe we wound up losing to them by seven. Great game, back and forth the whole nine. Um, not a lot of tension in the game at all. Snell's my guy. We've been coaching for years. There's a rule that says make sure that the other coach walk you out, right? Mm -hmm. We've both been coaching for years. There's no tension. He doesn't need me to walk him out. I don't need to walk him out. Him and his guys walk outside the rec center and he get jumped. Wow. Find the community.